Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all today? Good. It's uh, great to see you all. Thank you so much for coming uh, on this Thursday. I brought with me our Deputy Secretary of State, uh, John Sullivan. Uh, he is here uh, to provide a few remarks, not only about the decision to retire uh, for the Under Secretary Tom Shannon, uh, his intent to retire, which was announced earlier today. He'd like to say a few words about that. In addition, as many of you know, our uh, Deputy Secretary just returned from a trip to Iraq and Afghanistan, and he's going to provide you with a readout of that trip and some of his meetings there. He has time to take just a few of your questions. I'll call on you since I know you all, and he hasn't had the opportunity to meet you all yet. And then I'll take over the brief room from there, and we can go over all the world events. All right. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our Deputy Secretary, John Sullivan. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Heather, uh, for that kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a bittersweet day for me here at, uh, at the department. My, uh, my good friend and, uh, and colleague, Tom Shannon, has announced that uh, he intends to retire. Uh, we've talked about this over time for the last few months about what he might uh, do with his his career and uh, his now approaching his 35th year in the uh, in the Foreign Service he is uh, he's been a great friend to me an indispensable person in helping me adjust to uh, my service here as Deputy Secretary of State I owe him a great deal um, I started well I first met him uh, and heard about him when I served in the Bush 43 administration and he was the Assistant Secretary for Western Hemisphere Affairs and I was the Deputy Secretary of Commerce and we had a lot of uh, interaction on uh, free trade agreements in Central America and Colombia and so forth and uh, he was a legend then and his stock has only risen uh, in my estimation since then for me. Uh, so it's a sad day for me but uh, it's the right move for him personally and, uh, and professionally, so we wish him all the best, and he is doing it in a uh, professional, dignified way. He will stay through um, the, uh, the confirmation of his successor uh, and be a great help to Secretary Tillerson, and particularly to me. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's bittersweet, uh, a little sad for me to see uh, such a good friend uh, and dear colleague uh, retire. So. He is, uh, he really exhibits all that's finest about both the Foreign Service and the Civil Service. He's served six presidents and ten secretaries of state. Um, I can say having served in four different cabinet departments for three different presidents that I've met very few uh, who match Tom for his commitment, his intelligence, his, his wise counsel, his sense of humor. But I can say that there have been others like him that I've worked with across government, both in the Foreign Service, the Civil Service, and in the Uniform Services. Um, a small number of senior people who are really the key cogs that make the wheels of government turn. And Tom Shannon has been one of those for many years, and he will be uh, deeply missed here by all, and particularly by me. Uh, so with that, I'll shift gears and turn to my recent trip to Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, it was an important opportunity for me to reaffirm to, uh, to those countries the United States' commitment to strengthening our, our partnership with each of them and our commitment to bringing enduring peace and prosperity to them. Uh, the trip also gave me an opportunity to salute our hardworking ambassadors. Uh, John Bass in Afghanistan and Doug Silliman in Iraq, terrific ambassadors for the United States. Their staffs at our embassy, uh, embassies, uh, our uh, women and men in uniform, our Iraqi and Afghan employees and third country nationals who work at our, uh, our missions. For their, to thank them for their invaluable service to our country and for their daily tireless contributions in very difficult circumstances. Their work is indispensable in helping Iraq and Afghanistan build prosperous democratic societies, defeat terrorism, and provide humanitarian assistance to millions of people affected by conflict in both countries. On my trip, my first stop was in Baghdad. Uh, I led a U.S. delegation consisting of U.S. Ambassador Iraq Suleiman, 
Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, Andrew Peake, and Treasury Deputy Assistant Secretary Eric Meyer. Uh, and we convened, along with Iraqi counterparts, uh, the fifth U.S.-Iraq Higher Coordinating Committee. Uh, the Iraqi side was led by Deputy Foreign Minister Nizar Karula and other senior Iraqi officials. The meeting was convened under the Strategic Framework Agreement, which was signed by the United States and Iraq in 2008, to affirm our partnership and intent to forge lasting bonds of cooperation and friendship. During uh, our meeting of this, uh, this committee, we agreed to continue to lay the foundation for future collaboration, particularly in the areas of trade and finance and political and diplomatic cooperation. As one example, we established a group of uh, Iraqi and U.S. officials to work on mutual issues concerning visas, visas for U.S. business leaders traveling to uh, Iraq and vice versa for Iraqis traveling to the United States. We also agreed that the upcoming Iraq Reconstruction Conference in Kuwait would provide an important opportunity for the government of Iraq to showcase a number of attractive investment opportunities for foreign investors, including many American companies, and to demonstrate that Iraq is open for business. I also had the opportunity to congratulate my Iraqi interlocutors on their recent defeat of the uh, so-called ISIS Caliphate. Uh, Iraq, the territory of Iraq, has been reclaimed from the terrorists who wreak such horrible violence upon uh, the people of, uh, of Iraq. The U.S.-led global coalition was proud to partner with Iraq as they fought to retake their country from ISIS and will continue to support Iraqis to ensure that ISIS is dealt an enduring defeat. We look forward to further coordination on this effort at the ministerial level of the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS that will take place in Kuwait on February 13th. During meetings with senior Iraqi officials, I also emphasized the need for a continued dialogue between the government of Iraq and the Kurdistan regional government. I encouraged Prime Minister Abadi to continue to work with KRG Prime Minister Netjervan Bazani and Deputy Prime Minister Kubad Talabani to reach practical accommodations on matters such as the payment of salaries and reopening of airports in Iraqi Kurdistan and international flights in accordance with the Iraqi Constitution. Finally, I reaffirmed the United States' continued commitment to a federal, prosperous, unified, and democratic Iraq, one that meets the aspirations of all Iraqis. I also reinforced these points during my second stop in Iraq, which was in Erbil, to meet personally with Prime Minister Barzani and Deputy Prime Minister Talabani. Following my visit uh, to Erbil, I traveled to Kabul, which, as you know, has been the victim of several devastating and senseless terrorist attacks over the last two weeks. I was able to extend in person our condolences, thoughts, and prayers to the hundreds of victims, their families, and all of those affected by such terrible acts of violence. Those affected include uh, women and men who work at our embassy in Kabul, although we were fortunate that no one uh, who works at the embassy was, uh, was hurt uh, or killed in the, uh, in the attacks. Several of our colleagues have uh, friends and relatives who were. And in fact, there was a memorial service today in Kabul at our embassy for those who were uh, so deeply affected. And again, we extend our condolences to them. The United States remains firmly committed to supporting the Afghan people and their government's efforts to achieve peace, security, and prosperity for their country. While in Kabul, I had the opportunity to meet with Afghan President Ashraf Ghani, Chief Executive Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, Foreign Minister Saladin Rabani, and other government leaders. During each of these meetings, Afghanistan's leadership made it clear to me that, despite the recent tragic events, the Afghan government will continue to work to create the necessary conditions to bring the Taliban to the negotiating table and establish an environment for a sustained peace. We applaud this conviction as the path to peace and reconciliation must be an Afghan-led and Afghan-owned process, as we have laid out in the President's South Asia strategy. Unfortunately, at this stage, everyone but the Taliban appears ready for peace. 
The Taliban's reprehensible attacks targeting innocent civilians demonstrate that they are not ready to enter into good faith peace negotiations. The United States will continue to support our Afghan partners to defeat ISIS, Al Qaeda, and other terrorist groups in Afghanistan and to deny them and their affiliates safe haven and material support. Afghan leaders and I also discussed security cooperation and the importance of holding timely, credible, and inclusive parliamentary and presidential elections. During an executive committee meeting of the Afghanistan Compact, we reviewed Afghanistan's progress in the areas of security, governance, rule of law, economic development, and peace and reconciliation. I applaud the efforts of the Afghan government thus far and welcome those officials in continuing to make further progress. I also met with a, with a group of inspiring young Afghan leaders from a range of sectors, spoke to aid and humanitarian assistance leaders, including those from Save the Children who were so devastatingly affected by the attack on their, uh, their facility. Uh, I met also with uh, individuals from across the political spectrum. During all of these meetings, I underscored the United States' commitment to working with the government and the people of Afghanistan to bring pre-security and sustained economic growth to that country and to the regions. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. For being here, um, with the, during your visit to uh, and during your meeting with the Afghanistan government, did Pakistan came up during a discussion? And then, uh, given the recent attacks in Kabul, uh, how does that help the United States to make the case uh, that Pakistan need to step up cooperation with uh, in, in anti-terrorism? Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, our strategy, our policy with respect to Afghanistan, as you know, is really a regional strategy. It's a South Asia policy. Pakistan figures very importantly in that. Uh, in my discussions with the, with the Afghan government, uh, we focused on the relationship between Afghanistan and Pakistan, the need for continued bilateral discussions between Afghanistan and Pakistan, but I also emphasize that the United States must continue to have its bilateral relationship with Pakistan, both on its own terms and with respect to the region, including Afghanistan. We have made clear to the Pakistani government our expectations for them to take action against terrorists uh, that are uh, in sanctuaries in Pakistan to uh, to reduce the pressure uh, and, the, and the threat of violence in Afghanistan and to contribute to a lasting, endure, enduring peace in Afghanistan and the region. That was certainly part of my conversations with the uh, Afghan leadership. Um, thank you very much, sir. Do you think that you made progress in resolving the differences between Erbil and Baghdad on your trip? Uh, I think the, the, uh, uh, that the governments in Baghdad and Erbil have made progress. I was uh, delighted to be there to meet with both sides separately to encourage continued progress, continued dialogue between the government in Erbil, Prime Minister Barzani, and uh, Prime Minister Abadi. As you know, Prime Minister Barzani traveled to, uh, to Baghdad recently. We raised with, uh, with both governments some of the issues that I discussed in my opening statement, reopening the airports to international travel, payment of salaries, uh, some of the issues that you're very familiar with that have separated the two governments. Uh, the, uh, the impression I got from my discussions was that both sides believe that progress is being made. They are continuing discussions. We are, uh, my message to each, uh, to each party in Baghdad and in Erbil was to continue those discussions, make progress on these issues, particularly those where the differences are small and we can resolve them, establish more trust between the two governments, and move forward and tackle the, uh, the larger issues. Thank you, uh, Josh, from AP. Uh, thank you sir. Um, uh, you touched on the negotiations issue in Afghanistan. Uh, the president recently declared that the United States won't talk to the Taliban that, in light of these attacks. Um, is that a, a change in 
position and as far as talks between the Afghan government and the Taliban, does the United States still support our Afghan partners talking to the Taliban? And if not, what's the resolution to this? Sure. Um, <clears throat> the President's comments were not a change in our South Asia policy. Our policy is for uh, continue to, for us to continue to put pressure on the Taliban, military, economic, political, to bring them to, uh, to the negotiating table where uh, the ultimate resolution will be through an Afghan-led and Afghan-owned peace process. I think the President's comments, are, well, one other thing I should say about the policy, one significant change uh, in our policy uh, is it's conditions-based, not time-based. So uh, we are not setting a timeline by which the security issues must be resolved, otherwise we'll withdraw. We're not setting a timeline for a date by which negotiations must begin. The policy is conditions-based. And I think the President's comments reflects the fact that conditions over the last two weeks in Kabul do not suggest that the Taliban is interested in peace talks. That's not to say that we are repudiating our policy. Our policy is to continue to put pressure on the Taliban to bring them eventually with patience and perseverance to peace talks that are Afghan-led and Afghan-owned. Okay. Yes, sir, are you concerned that the May election, the election set in May, may bring further instability in Iraq, especially with Powers competing, those are pro Iran and those are against Iran and so on. And how do you see this playing out, working out? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, our message, my message in my, uh, my meetings with the, with the government in, uh, in Baghdad was to encourage uh, the elections to go forward on May 12th. We think that that is the best path to a stable, democratic, free, federal, unified, prosperous Iraq. Uh, and the response I had from Prime Minister uh, Abadi was that he was committed to those elections and the Iraqis are committed to those elections. Political process, as we see even in our own country, is not necessarily tidy and pretty, uh, but it's essential. It's essential to demonstrate their commitment to democracy. And one thing I reminded my, my, uh, my interlocutors in, uh, in Baghdad was a, a feature of U.S. history, that it is possible even in dangerous, fractured uh, situations, even in the midst of war, to hold national elections, as the United States did in 1864 during the Civil War. So the overriding commitment to democracy is what's important. Uh, Prime Minister Abadi has expressed that, and we're most grateful for that, and we're looking forward to doing all we can to support uh, Iraq in holding free, fair, and democratic elections on May 12th. Sir, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for your questions. Thank you. Yours. No? Okay, come on back anytime. <laughs> we, we'd love to have you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.